but what I would do, a, a job would come down the line, and I'd have to look and see what kind of cover it needed. So, um, um, like we might have 61, 62, 63, and 64 covers, and then we might have 161, 162, 163, and 164, plus 261, 2, 3, and 4, and three, um, 361, and 362, and so on and so forth, plus a lot of other covers. I, right offhand, I can't tell you how many covers we had, but I've got, I still got tickets from those jobs. I can go and look it up and I can tell you how many jobs I had, how many different jobs. Well, the thing of it was, the 61 was always going to be gray. And the 61 went on maybe the cheapest holes made. The 261 was, a, was still gray, but it would be a better piece of material. And the 361 and so on and so forth. And then there's a lot of other numbers too. And um, then of course at one time there, we made Pontiac Springs. Um, at one time we made springs for Cadillacs, and um, but so I mean, um, it was a job where it kept your brain working. You know, I had to stop and think, what number is this? And you had to run and get get that piece of upholstery and lay it on the job. And then there'd be some wires, maybe this long, well some of them this long, that you'd have to poke in and you'd have to cut a little hole here and poke them in that little hole and poke the wire clear around and come clear around here. You know, and. Um, um, but anyhow, I didn't get fired. And uh, then uh, um, I'd worked there maybe four or five weeks. But come to find out, they, the union had put in for a raise for that job. They said they wasn't making enough money working on that job. So now I get a back paycheck for something like 40 hours. <laughs> and Hilda did too. So everybody was so tickled to think that Hilda, old Rob got rid of Hilda. But it was Cadillac that got rid of me. <laughs> but the thing of it is, I had been promoted. And what I realized, Hilda had been promoted too. Well then, uh, Christmas comes along of course. What does Hilda get for Christmas? One little boy gives her a 29 cent bottle of perfume. Another little boy gives her a 15 cent um, bottle of something else. And the third child gives her a 10 cent bottle of something else, you know. And But Hilda's happy. While these other girls was coming in, Oh, my husband got me a new diamond. You know, he bought her this, he bought her a diamond when they got married, but uh, now they've been married 15 years and he works over at Olds. He's got a good job, she's got a good job. Now he buys her a expensive diamond. And some other woman comes in and oh, she's got a new refrigerator. And, but again, her husband works over at Oldsmobile or he works to fish her body or he works someplace. I mean, it's a, these other girls for the most part was two paycheck families. And, uh, but Hilda's happy she got a 29 cent bottle of perfume and, but she was happy because these little kids thought, just like the little girl that helps me down from the bathroom, <laughs> she's helping me and I'm tickled to death. I mean, <laughs> I'm real pleased about it. But Hilda was pleased too. And of course, again, that's what I got for Christmas too, was a 29 cent bottle of perfume or whatever. But, uh, so, um, but a lot of these girls, they couldn't, they couldn't see that um, Hilda had been promoted. The truth of it is, Hilda, those girls couldn't have taken Hilda's job away from her because Hilda had more seniority than they did. But they could take mine away from me because I didn't have that much seniority. So but there's a dozen girls there that could have had my job if they'd have applied for it. Well, anyhow. So when I, be, but when I, when he first began to, the rumor first went around that old Rob was going to get rid of Hilda, I used to come home and cry about it. I mean, I felt so bad to think it. That man here, he was 55 years old, in the neighborhood of 55, he wasn't 60 maybe yet, but why did he pick on her? Was he so damn dumb he couldn't say the truth of it was, he wasn't damn dumb, he was damn smart. <laughs> and he was, um, he was promoting Hilda. But he had to tear her down to nothing in front of these, to these other girls. Well, anyhow, um, but for a long time I couldn't see it. So this one when we were eating I t was telling her about this Blanche Jardine. And, and Hilda, I said, why are these other girls so jealous? And what Hilda said is they're happy. She has no right to be happy. She should be absolutely miserable because so-and-so got a beautiful diamond and Hilda only got a 20 million cent bottle of perfume. Of course I did too. <laughs> And um, uh, so I can see that um, 
around some people, don't be too happy, because that only disturbs some people. You know, you may have had your legs cut off or something, but still don't pretend you're happy, because you're supposed to be absolutely miserable now. Uh, or, um, but you see, that is just about the whole story. Well, then, eating lunch upstairs, it was a girl from Vermontville that ate at the same table I did. She sat across the table from me. And one day she says, I wish I had your paycheck. And that, that was when, by that time, everybody, I made, I think, 10 cents more an hour than what they was making. But um, she says, I wish I had your paycheck. And she was a woman, oh, maybe 25 years old. Her husband worked at Oldsmobile. But I was smart at that time. I was smarter than I was. Uh, I gained some, got some intelligence in the meantime. I said, I wish I had your husband and his paycheck. And then I said, and you could keep your husband. <laughs> Just let me have his paycheck. <laughs> you can keep your husband. <laughs> and the next day she apologized, which she should have. Yeah. But why did she say it in the first place? I can't think what that is. I've heard that before. Probably that. Well, it wouldn't be a trash truck on a Sunday, would it? Oh, it's somebody backing up. They're backing up yeah. with a truck. It might be. I don't think her truck would make it. I don't think her truck makes that noise when it backs up. But anyhow, it's like that, it? yeah, it's probably something. Somebody backing up that's got one of those little things on there. Um, so again, working to fish your body in more ways than one, it gave me um, a lot of confidence that even though I did that burn my sock and my slip showed and I had more makeup on this cheek than I did on this cheek. Again, uh, down to Fisher Body, I learned a lot. You more self-confidence. Yes, absolutely. But the same women that thought I was a, uh, well, after all, the women that work in shops or, fish, or prostitutes, everybody knows that. <laughs> or at least a lot of women think they know it. And I felt, and I, sometimes to some of these women, I've been, I've so bad I want to say, well, do you think your husband's having an affair with some girl at Oldsmobile? <laughs> uh, of course, they knew their husband wasn't, but they knew that the girls that went there to work, that's why they went there to work. So, uh, but uh, the same girls now, maybe their husband's been dead for 10 years, but the same girls now that realize I'm getting a pension from General Motors, they don't like me because I'm getting a pension from General Motors. <laughs> so again, um, I don't want to go back to your <laughs> Why don't you tell me some more about some of the trips you started taking? Oh, well, it's starting to rain again. Well, when I, um, when I got that trip, truck then, and took the kids to Washington, D.C., and I went with the truck six times and took two children each time, so there's 18 kids I took to Washington, D.C., and over restored Williamsburg, and um, then I took you in the Corvair, went to the Mills Fair, took Amy, um, flew down with Amy, so that makes 20, and then I took um, Jonathan and Susan, uh, then after I sold the truck and got rid of the truck, um, I got this, oh, well, then I took the backpacking class down to Michigan State, and what I realized, if you can carry enough stuff on your back to go backpacking, I can get enough stuff in the trunk to that little red opal to go camping. So then I bought the two-man tent, and then I took um, Jonathan and Susan to Washington, D.C., and on the same trip, and slept in a tent. Um, well, then I, when I still had the truck, I made quite a few trips back east doing genealogy. And one trip in the far side of Missouri, looking up uh, the one blast, um, but I never did find them. Um, I wanted to find out when that man died, and I never did find that out. But he had two sons. The thing of it is, he's, chances are, along the last year or so of his life, he went to, um, he's buried. He probably went to live with one or the other of those two sons, and he's buried there. And that's where he died. But uh, as far as I know, nobody knows where or anything about it. So. Um, uh, I think I know what his two boys' names are, but I kind of think they left the state. 
But then you had a girl, and she was in Kansas, but again, I have no idea what her married name was. So that's a whole trip um, to find out that branch of the family. That's a whole other trip. Somebody else has got to do that. <laughs> um, well, then, uh, doing genealogy, I found out that this Alma, or I found out that um, of these ten Howard children, there's one of them I've never have found, a girl, and she's the youngest one. I've never found her. I don't have any idea. She might have died when she's 16, and she might have got married while she lived in um, um, Weedsport, New York. So now she's got a different last name, but until I can find out who she married, or I mean, I have no idea even what her first name is. Um, but then what I did find out eventually was that um, Daniel Howard, one of those seven boys, uh, left Allegan County, Michigan, and went to um, Virginia in 1875, I think it was. So then, um, down to State Library, they sent and got me the 1910 census for the state of uh, Virginia, and I found him in there, and I knew it was him. One thing, there was only two Daniel Howards in the state of Virginia in that census, and the other one was black, <laughs> so that was a real help. I was real glad they were still putting black and white in there. And um, um, oh, I found him in the sound bags. Yeah. So then they could write to the state library. Could write to uh, Texas, I think it was, and they could get um, um, the census for that community. And when they did, the man next door to Daniel Howard was um, oh, what was it? I can't think. But the, the kid was born in Calhoun County in 1855. And so, I, oh, I knew I had the right person because here he's got this, his son living next door to him. And so then on one of the trips to Washington, that's when I took uh, Jonathan and Susan in the Opal. Um, when we come home then um, and started west, we've gone just so far out of Richmond and we I can't think now what the name of the town was, the little town where he lived, or what was his mailing address, and went there hoping to find the cemetery, because then I can come around to the cemetery and find out what year he died. And um, I, no cemetery. <laughs> so then uh, finally I spied the funeral home. I thought, there, now they'll have all the records, you know, and they'll tell me a lot. And went to the funeral home, and he said, no, his records, he would have had to die by, um, he couldn't possibly live beyond 1910, I think. Or I'm not just sure now. Maybe he couldn't possibly have lived to be 1920. But anyhow, this man's records, funeral records, only with that, that funeral home had only been there since 1930. No way could he possibly live to 1930. But he said there's a Robert Howard that lives up the road here. He says there won't be any relation because he's only been here 40 years. And so it's no relation. But however, they may know who the other Howards are. So I went up there, and this Mrs. Howard, the first thing she said, she called this woman by name. Um, I can't think now what it is. I wish I could find it. And she said her father was um, um, this boy. This boy that was born in 19 or 1855 in Calhoun County. That was what her father's name was. So I, and then she calls that woman and said, "There's a woman from Michigan looking up the Howards." And would they like, or would she like to have me send, me send me over there? And she said yes. And so I went over. Well, her sister was in the hospital, and she was on her last legs. And so she said she didn't want, she still wanted to go to the hospital and see her sister. And so she called up um, Ernie Mason. And Ernie Mason is um, a grandson, a great grandson of this Daniel Howard. So then they drove over to Ernie's house, Ernie Mason's house, and um, Ernie Mason brought out a, he had a brand new house, but he still had bricks and pieces of roofing and all that stuff laying around in his yard. I mean, they hadn't got the yard cleaned up yet, but the house was brand new, beautiful, two-story house. Um, 
But he brought out a box of square of old family photographs, and he thought maybe I would recognize something through there, but I didn't see one picture there that I could say, yeah, this is my grandpa Howard, or this is my whatever. But anyhow, we knew we had the right, we knew we was relation. And uh, so then he took me over to the house where Daniel Howard had lived, where he built a house on the river. And uh, over there then was, uh, they had gravestones for everybody that died at, when they owned that property. So they was all buried right there in their own garden, as you might say. So I got, a ch so I saw all these gravestones. And then while I was, he was over there showing me the gravestones. Then he took me to a church and showed me where in the churchyard where some of the Howards are buried. Then when he got back home, his wife had called up these two sisters, Alma and Anna, and told them that uh, uh, Ernie had taken me for to show me the cemetery and so on and so forth. So then we come back. Yeah, Ernie had two children. So um, Jonathan and Stu Susan st stayed and played with the two kids. And then when I come back, Anna and Alma was both there. And um, then I said, well, I had to go on because I had to get up here to this next campground and get a place to camp before it got dark. Well, they said, no, come on back and stay to their house. So the kids and I went back to their house and slept in their house on the floor in our sleeping bags instead of sleeping in the tent. Um, um, but anyhow, we stayed, we stayed all night there and left the next morning and went on and then we had to stop and buy groceries and go up on the skyline drive and camp up there and so on and so forth. And, um, but this Ernie Howard, he said, now don't wait 105 years to come back. <laughs> I always got to laugh out of that. 105 years, they, Daniel Howard left Michigan and now 105 years later I go down and call on the family. <laughs> don't wait 105, don't, me not wait 105 years to go back as if there wouldn't be anybody down there alive that's alive now. And um, even these kids that was with me, I would assume that they might not be alive in 100 years from now either. Well, anyhow, so then I got acquainted with Alma, Anna and Alma. And um, they were both, um, they both lost their husbands. And, um, but Anna's husband had, had a lot to do with woodwork. So she had tools, and she knew how to use these tools. So she bought this van that had two seats, and then here's this, all this space back here. So she put some brackets in there. She built a cupboard to sit right at the back. So when you open the doors up on the back, here is the cupboard. And it's got one like that writing desk. It's got a leaf that drops down to make a work table. So you could open up those two doors drop this leaf down and here's your coffee pot and here's your frying pan and here's your forks and your knives and your spoons and here's your pile of plates. Here's everything, you know, so that you could back that up to a picnic table and you could get your meal, you could cook your whole meal and everything right there. Well then on the inside of the bag she had these brackets and she'd slid um, pieces of plywood in there and with mattresses on them. So, um, uh, so here my bed was at the very back, right next to the cupboard. And then um, um, there was three of us women on that trip. Anna slept on the floor, <laughs> Anna herself. And then um, a piece of plywood pulled out from underneath my bed, my mattress, and also an, a second mattress. So here was the bed for. Um, Oh, yeah, I can think now. I, I remember the woman now, but I can't think what her name was. Um, no, that wasn't what it was, because the one woman with us slept on the front seat of the truck. I slept back here, and I slept on the floor. No, she didn't sleep on the front seat. She slept on the second seat, because the steering wheel would have been way on the first. But anyhow, then we went west and went to 10 national parks. And um, um, she had written to me and we'd written back and forth. And, uh, but the bargain or the understanding was that I'd come down there the last of May. And on the first day of June, we'd take start out on this trip. Well, when I, and on the counter, Paul Bond had given me a nice counter. But on that counter, <laughs> you can't believe the things that happened. There was no June 1st. 
There was a June second and third and fourth and fifth, but I don't know when they made that counter. Something went wrong someplace. There was no June first. So when I got down there, I told Alma or Anna, I said, "We can't go in June first. There is no June first this year." And I can get my, I got my counter out to prove to her that there was no June first this year. So we, so uh, we went. Uh, when we got down there, there was less to do than what we thought. So we actually left there on the last day of May. Because it was, and we always laughed about it, said we was going June 1st, but there was no June 1st. Uh, but we still went, if there had been a June 1st, we still went the last day of May. But, and went out there and we was to the Grand Canyon. I mean, that was a wonderful trip. A wonderful trip. And it was while we was out there on that trip that um, when we come to go out of the park that morning, here was a note from Mrs. Black. And I said, that's me. And they all said, no, there's other blacks in the world. I'm not the only black in the world. And, um, or maybe it was H black, I forgot. But I said, I've got to stop and see what that is. So I did, and well, what, um, it said call um, Robert, I think. But anyhow, what it was, of course, was the fact that Ockham had died. And his was being brought back to Eaton Rapids, of course, and buried beside a Katie and all that. Well, now my choice is, or my, the thing to think about now, if I go back, they've got to take me someplace where I can fly back. But if I fly back to Eaton Rapids locality, my truck is down in Virginia. If I fly back to Richmond, somebody's got to come and get me, take me to my truck. And then I've still got to drive home. And it just seemed to me as if, uh, this might be best to just forget this. And then uh, again, these women pooled their money, and each one put in so much money. And now if I dr fall out of the trip, they've got less money to take the trip with. And I thought, it isn't that important that I come back. So uh, I called Robert and told him I guess I wouldn't come back. But I've always felt bad to think that I didn't come back. But if I had to come back, I would have still felt bad. So. Um, that's the way, though.